Life Travelers, and welcome to Life Mastery TV, your source for inspiration, empowerment, and fulfillment. My name is David McLeod. I am your Life Mastery Coach, and I'm really excited because we got a very, very interesting topic today. Before I go there, I just want to remind you that there is a chat area on your right-hand side, so if you have comments or questions, please feel free to post them there so that we can respond. You know, when we're faced with the prospect of dealing with our issue, sometimes we look for solutions that address the problem as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, this often leads us to consider symptoms only, rather than dealing with the underlying challenges or wounds or traumas that led to the symptoms in the first place. As a result of this, we sometimes find ourselves relying on religion or spirituality or some other modality to heal our wounds for us. This is the essence of a situation that I have come to call the spiritual bypass. Now, sadly, these kinds of approaches generally don't work, at least not in the long run. While they, they may provide temporary relief up front, sooner or later, we have to address our core issue, at least if we want to achieve true fulfillment in our lives. Now, today, I have invited my friend and colleague, Nadia Kim, to discuss this highly relevant topic with me today. Nadia is someone who has had personal experience with this spiritual bypass trap, and she has a lot of great ideas about how to avoid it and how to get out of it if you happen to find yourself stuck there. As a life and spirituality coach, she focuses on what makes her happy, and that means sharing her insights, her wisdom, and her gifts with the world. Please join me in welcoming Nadia Kim to our program today. Welcome, Nadia, and thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. Yeah, it's a good day. We had a great conversation at the beginning, and uh, maybe some of that will show up during the, the rest of our program. But right now, I wanted to just get to this thing, this, this idea of the spiritual bypass trap. I think when I hear that term, I, I can imagine that other people, when they hear it, they may get a little scared by it. They, they may find it a little bit frightening. Now, you and I both know and, and encourage people to have deeply spiritual practices that they can uh, go to on a regular basis. But how can we shed some light on this without scaring people away from their spirituality? Well, I think that it's really important to understand that spirituality is a tool and if you think of it like a plumber or a contractor they're not going to go anywhere without being equipped with the necessary tools to do the job well for us humans humanity we're here because we have a job uh, that job is spiritual growth if you look at any of the texts across all of the different main religions and different cultural settings what you notice is there's a theme of personal growth there's a theme of being in a certain way and obviously we're humans and so being far from perfect sometimes being in whatever the the met, the mode or the the stereotype that the culture or religion is outlining isn't something that is easily attainable for us. But what, what happens in that process, though, is as we're all trying to follow the tools of that spiritual practice, we are, you know, working as hard as we can to, to be what that stereotype is. And as a pro, you know, as a part of that, we then end up causing the spiritual bypass to occur. So it's really looking at it from this idea that how can I stay uniquely me and at the same time continue using the tools that I'm learning as a part of whatever religion or spiritual practice that I'm following. All right, that sounds great. And and so what if if I understand you correctly, what I'm hearing is while the the spiritual practice it has its own set of rules and and regulation. I don't like using that. I mean, it's, it's more like a, like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Paradigm, I guess, a way of being within the religious environment or the spiritual environment. They have a collective set of beliefs and all these other things that they want people to adhere to. And so what happens is by going along with those rules and those beliefs and so forth, we may forget about doing the inner work ourselves that needs to happen. And I mean, one of the things that, that even 
Christianity teaches is God helps those who help themselves. And if people aren't willing to step in and do their own work, then the work is not necessarily going to get done magically or miraculously by some external uh, spiritual entity. Is, is that what you're getting at? Um, essentially, yes. It's, it's understanding that, you know, within each of us, we have our own challenges in our lives. That's inevitable. We all do. Mm -hmm. But what we can't do is we can't suppress the emotions that we're feeling around those challenges. And to be whatever this mold is, this stereotype within our religion, sometimes that's what we do. We suppress those feelings because we think that they're not acceptable if we're going to fit into that mold. And so the the whole premise behind what is spiritual growth, what is real growth? You know, we're all spiritual entities living a physical existence. And so because of that, you you can't focus on the physical aspect and forget about the the truth of who you are, the truth of, of what you are, a spark of divine. And right. we all are here on that journey. Those journeys are unique. However, there's a lot of themes that cross over. And that's what you know gives us the human connection. And one of those is understanding that not all the challenges in our lives feel like roses and cotton candy. They hurt and they're painful and they trigger us. They cause negative, what's considered a negative emotion, which really is just a, an, it's an emotion that has a slower vibration, but it's, it's basically the, the anger, the resentment, the fear, things that are triggered in us. We're not good enough. The lack of self-worth, lack of value. So those are the, the, the aspects of us that we tend to suppress when we're trying to fit into the mold of whatever the spiritual teachings are that we're learning. But right. as you said, the key to understanding how to really embody any spiritual practice is to understand that we cannot keep a dirty house <laughs> and at the same time, act, you know, go out looking all extra presentable, but our house is a mess. Because the house is the, the the metaphor of your mind and your your emotional state and your emotional body. So right, right. <laughs> I like that. That's a good image. I uh, one of my own teachers used to say, it's kind of like when when we we try to pile on you know positive beliefs and positive thoughts on top of what we're you know what's going on in our subconscious. It's kind of like stepping into the shower with all your dirty clothes on and then coming back out and putting a clean set of clothes on top of the dirty clothes. Mm. You know, yeah. you may think that you've really gotten the dirt out of the, you know, the under the lower or level of clothing, but you haven't, you have to get underneath. You have to take them off. You have to sterilize them. You have to go through a, a deep process. Another one of my, my uh, colleagues talks about, you know, the root cause analysis. It's kind of like going into your garden. You know, if you just cut off the tops of the weeds, you don't stop them from growing. You have to pull them out by the roots. Mm -hmm. And you have to take every single one of these issues that you have, get the roots out before you can actually heal the, the, the problems, the traumas, whatever, the wounds that are there. And furthermore, once you pull out those weeds, what you end up with is you and the rocks and everything else that are in there, you create a garden that is much more fertile. And therefore, all those positive beliefs will start to finally take root. That's the key. And I think what you're saying is much of our religious dogma tries to just pile on. It tries to say, think positive thoughts, uh, do this way of being, do that way of being. But none of it ever really says, dig in and find the flaws and the errors and the and the wounds and the traumas and heal them you know very few religions actually teach us that so this is a great great point that you brought up thank you no absolutely I mean, even with kabbalah which was like where i really began my spiritual awakening several years ago um they actually do encourage you to understand like what's happening to you and that it's yours and kind of shifting from being a victim to being empowered to understand that everything that happens to you happens for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And they actually point, you know, use the term that instead of it's a, being a challenge in your life, it's an opportunity because the whole thing is, is that every time you are presented with the opportunity, you get to decide how are you going to handle it, thereby empowering yourself.
The only feeling I, I have about it that I think happened for me um, by the time I ended up leaving, because by the time I had left, I was a mentor. They wanted me to become a, uh, a teacher. And, you know, I was becoming more expansive and, and, you know, the world of spirituality and assimilating all kinds of ideas across the world that felt good to me and that resonated. But I feel like at some point I ended up on this spiritual cloud where like I was so disconnected from normal people because I was spiritually bypassing my life away. At that, I had gotten to this point where I had done everything and accepted, yes, this is my opportunity. How am I going to deal with it? And being empowered to make those decisions. But I still wasn't understanding that you walk a fine line between acceptance and suppression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> And you can accept all you want that the light put this in your life, the divine source put that in your life, and it's for you, and you can move through that challenge. But if you're not asking yourself a very basic question, how do I feel about this right now? And if I'm feeling bad about it, even though I know that the that it was there for me, what what is what's underlying? What is my my subconscious? What is the the deepness of of what, the complexity of my minds and my emotions? What is it trying to tell me? Yeah. What am I missing in that? And yeah. I feel like until um, I got until I left Kabbalah, did I then understand? I got my my angel wings got clipped, and I came crashing down to the planet Earth. <laughs> And then it was like, because I had stopped having issues because I had understood and I had accepted. So life was great. But then as soon as, as reality hit, all of a sudden I started getting pummeled. Right. And it was like thing after thing after thing. And I was like, wait, what do I do? How do I, I do? And, you know, fortunately being, you know, being in, in the programs I had been in the life coaching, becoming a, a certified hypnotherapist, like all of those really helped. I had tools to understand that the inner work and right. so but it what really the shadow work the aspect of you know dealing with those things and really truly digging in i feel like has really only been happening in maybe the past year and and a little bit over that yeah. to to go to those deeper levels because it took a long time to understand that you're not just because you accept doesn't mean you're not suppressing those emotions okay, exactly well, I can totally resonate with a lot of what you're saying. I, um, you know, I had my own journey that I had to go through. It wasn't quite the same as yours, but there were a lot of similarities along the way. And I remember when I first started doing what I now call shadow work, that it was pretty scary for me. I started, I think my first exposure to the real deep shadow work happened around 2003. And uh, it was both liberating and terrifying at the same time. Terrifying because I realized, oh my God, I'm exposing all this stuff, this guck, this horrible, nasty darkness inside me and people are seeing it. And I was terrified that they were just gonna hate me. They were gonna you know, run for the hills and try and avoid me. But what I found interesting is the exact opposite happened. The more I was able to go inside and learn more about those dark parts of myself, those shadow parts. And, and furthermore, not just do it for, by myself, but do it in the presence of other people who were witnessing this, the more I was creating connection with people. It was counterintuitive, you know, where when we say counterintuitive, we simply mean that the ego mind wasn't going to buy into it. And that's what was happening. That was what was happening. My ego mind had convinced me that if I were to expose any of this, I'm just going to create enemies. I'm going to be left alone. I'm going to die a painful, horrible death. And all that stuff was, was going on. So when I began the process and started seeing the opposite thing happen, I started thinking, oh, maybe I should be doing more of this. And that's what happened. I actually came to a point where I started looking at it as a kind of an adventure. Going cave spelunking, if you like, going into the caves, to, into the darkness to see what's there and just bringing a flashlight along. And more and more, I would see of myself parts that I had cast off years and years and years ago. And so being able to find those parts, rediscover them and start integrating back into my core being 
start to help making me whole again. And by the way, when that happened, all of a sudden spirituality started opening up for me. Prior to that, it was just a game I was playing, trying to fit in, trying to meet the, the needs of, a, of my religions and so forth. Mm -hmm. But now I look at spirituality as a whole different thing. It's a, you know, it's like going through that deep process work helped me to re recover, discover, heal, love, and integrate my true self. Yeah. And that's beautiful because I feel like that's, you know, that's what I've been going through. I mean, I feel like for me, like once I had separated from, from my husband was like the beginning. So like in 2017 was really when I was really starting to dig into those deeper layers. Because mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, all the five years of work with Kabbalah kind of were the, the other surface stuff that I really had to get through. And so by the time it was that all happened and then I, you know, he, you know, left and I started dating again. That's when all the triggers I found out. I was like, oh, my gosh, I am back to that broken 19 year old that I was. And here I was, you know, uh, 39 years old. But I was that, that broken 19 year old was was out. And, right. and and it was like, oh, my God, wait, where did you come from? Wait, you've been there all along, just kind of deep down inside under all the guck of negativity and everything that I had, you know, dealt with for 19 years of PTSD from the emotional trauma with my ex. What? And so then it was like, now I'm faced with her and I'm like, well, crap, how are we going to deal with this? So then it was like trigger after trigger after trigger. And, you know, at first I wasn't I still wasn't willing to to acknowledge her. You know, it right. really took some time and I was doing inner child work, but I wasn't doing inner young adult work. I wasn't doing inner teenager work. I was healing, working with the, the little girl in me that had all the traumas. But trauma right. for some of us, it doesn't just stop when we're children. It keeps Absolutely. going into yep. our adult years. Yep. And so that was like, you know, being faced with her was very difficult because the, the insecurities and the triggers there were really, really extreme. And and even she wasn't the ultimate trigger. It was yell you know, that younger child. It's just that she was the embodiment of all of the trauma from the young childhood up into that point. Right. And it really it's it was eye opening. And yes, it was very sometimes this work can be very painful. And and it's really important that that people understand it's some we can't we have to stop running from our pain. Um, there's a, I was taking a class that was teaching us about accepting death. Okay. It's called death, dying and hospice, part of my holistic wellness practitioner, uh, diploma program. And there's a book, a book by Thin Natch. I, I don't even want to butcher the guy's name, but I think he's a Buddhist and it was all about like the prayer, you know, prayer for dying and, and really meditations around, you know, embodying what it would be like if you were going to die. And mm -hmm. I was, afraid part of Kabbalah was very afraid of death very afraid of dying I'd watched a lot of people die in my life and I was afraid to die but what I didn't understand was my fear of death actually was rooted in my soul fearing leaving this planet at this point in time without doing what I came here to do You're right right all that deep inner work yeah. And so, you know, by the time I left Kabbalah, I had no longer feared death because my soul was being, being satisfied with, you know, what my, what I came here for. But, um, the, the, the ultimate thing that I got from that class though, was why are we running away from our pain? Why, why are we, why do we, we have, nobody wants a painful death. Why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, you know, so, so there's like this whole thing around understanding that we have a conditioning that pain is this bad thing. But it's not always a bad thing. And especially when we're dealing with the emotional pain, because mm -hmm. by being willing and brave enough to see the emotional pain and to work through the emotional pain, we, we get insight about ourselves. Number one, how strong we are, how resilient we are, our ability to overcome and be brave enough to make the decision to look at it unto itself, like it creates that layer of, of strengthen us and that that you know it's that indomitable spirit that that hum, you know humanity has to keep on thriving and, and living yeah but you know if, <clears throat> you know if we you know can be willing to to say okay this may be painful but i understand that it's not going to last forever 
that if I can just look at this and I can accept this and I can move through it and yes, you're going to cry and that's okay. And if I tell myself that everything that I experience as I'm going through this is okay, that I am safe to experience this, that I'm allowed to and give ourselves that, that um, permission, it won't be as bad as we think it is. Yeah. And so what if you cry through it? I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up this topic because I, I, you know, as you were initially talking about it, I was going to say almost exactly the same thing. It's my personal experience is whenever I anticipate something painful, the old ego mind starts creating its own little story and telling me to avoid this at all costs. It's going to hurt. And the truth of the matter is, every time I've ever gone through any one of these emotional releases that I've had in the past, I, I remember the most extreme one was the, the very first one that happened when, in 2003. And that's where all my rage came out in one explosive, uh, very carefully controlled scenario. While I was in it, I wasn't feeling any pain at all. I was just simply feeling release. After that rage came out, then the grief started coming out. I had I had stuff coming out of my head that I couldn't imagine. I mean, snot out of my nose, tears out of my eyes. I was like a floodgate. It, I had opened the gates. And that was, I will say, it was also very much a release, but it was simultaneously kind of uncomfortable. I think my ego mind was starting to chatter again. Oh, you're not supposed to let people see this, you know? So that was where the discomfort was coming from. But after it was over, oh my God, hallelujah. I felt fantastic. I couldn't talk. I had done so much screaming during the rage part. My voice was gone. Wow. But, my, and, but I was just, I was like illuminated from the inside out. It was an amazing, amazing experience. I would go through it again, to be honest with you. Yeah. I feel the same way. I mean, I, I have no stranger to tears. I do have a lot of water in my chart between, you know, being a Pisces rising and a moon in Scorpio. But I'm with you. Crying and releasing those energies, those emotions in us is so cathartic. Arctic. Yeah. And not only that, but people don't understand, we hold all those emotions in our body yeah. and weighs us down. The, the obesity problem in this country is the disease of the mind and the emotions because we have been told to buy your problems away, to escape in every form or fashion you can and not deal with your stuff. Yeah. And as a result of that, the the body is holding its fat in a physical form. But really what it is, is all those daggone emotions that you just refuse to acknowledge and you keep stuffing down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it's like, think about it. Like I tell my clients sometimes, I was like, hmm, intuitively, I'm like feeling something. And I was like, you, you have problems going to the bathroom, don't you? And they're like, yeah, because you're literally full of crap because you're holding it all in. You're holding all those emotions in. And it's just the metaphor becomes the physical manifestation of what's happening in our bodies. So, you know, we, let's talk about how, why, what the number one motivation has to be for us digging in and looking at these emotions that don't feel good and stop running away from them is the, the medical problems that we are bringing to ourselves as a result of not dealing with our stuff. The cancers, can just think about it. Cancer cells, what do they do? They're like thoughts. They eat away at you. So if you think about a situation you don't deal with, it eats at you, right? And you might tell a hundred people and you still don't feel better. Why? Because you're not asking yourself, what is this that I'm feeling and why am I feeling it? And what needs to happen in order for me to move from this, right? For resolution. Right. And you know, with cancer cells, that's what they do. They're eating away at stuff. So the metaphor of, from the disease becomes the physical issues in our body and then where are we at? Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. I totally agree with everything you're saying. And I, you know, it, it really, it makes me kind of sad, actually, that so many people in our world could have the kind of liberation and freedom that you and I have just by doing some of this work. 
And how do we get our message out to them in such a way that they'll actually pay attention? Because they're not paying attention. They're still watching TV. They're still going out, getting their comfort food. They're still doing all those things because it's habit. It's yeah. habit. They're stuck in the in the uh, the hamster wheel of habit. It's survival mode is what it is. Right. We have to shift from being in survival mode to truly living. And the yep. problem is, is it takes a catalyst. And really what that catalyst looks like is when people get fed up. When the right. universe puts enough pressure on them that they crack, then it's like, okay, I'm ready. Yeah, you almost have to be in crisis before something happens. Correct. Because yeah. We're, yeah. we're strong. We are so strong and right. we are so stubborn that uh -huh. sometimes it takes that. But I think that us being the embodiment of that message that we are sending out puts that ripple effect of energy out there just by us doing our work. It's, it's helping. So for every person that is willing to be strong enough and brave enough to, to take this path, they're helping the world too, just by doing their work and being that, that manifestation of, of, of the, the, the growth that has to happen. And by sharing your message, when you talk to your friends and you share, yes, I was going through this, but that also takes bravery. Being willing to stay in a place of authenticity. Mm -hmm. To know that we need to shed these masks that we have put on for other people that say, I am happy. My life is good. We do it on Facebook. We do it on social media. We do it as soon as we leave our house. We're like this. And then as soon as we leave our house, ding, you know, like, you know, it's like the choices. Yeah. And, and the truth is, is that it's, we've, we don't want to be judged. And so as a result of that, we don't share our story with people when we're being brave enough to do this work. And I think that it's really important that we stop. Uh oh. Well, unfortunately, it looks like Nadia, we just lost you there for a second. I'm sorry. Are you you're back on? Can you hear me? Yeah, that was so weird. <laughs> that must be so powerful what I was saying that it shut <laughs> Yeah, well, you overpowered the airwaves. What can I say? <laughs> but you got back on really quickly. That's a, that's a first too. I, yeah, I was well, like, you know, we talked a little bit about our dual nature. You mentioned earlier on when we when we began this discussion about how we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, and I know that that's absolutely true. A lot of people don't agree with it because they're just so caught up in the in the mental aspect, in the mindset of you know logic and and left brain thinking and all that kind of stuff but i think you're absolutely right when we when we do this work when we get connected to the to the essence of who we are deep down and when we work through those issues and we allow that energy to flow through us we begin to open up all kinds of new channels and gives us access back to that spiritual connection that we all have and that's really where life starts to open up and become much more magnificent. When we start to see how we are really one with all that is, we're connected to one another. Uh, we are far more connected than we even imagine, uh, even on the physical plane, I believe. And what do you think about that? I, I mean, I think you're right. I think what it also does is it actually strengthens your belief system. It strengthens whatever foundation of spiritual uh, practice you choose. It strengthens it because you're now uh, taking that connection and you become the embodiment of that connection. Yeah. For instance, I mean, how can you how can you really love yourself and say you love yourself if you're not willing to acknowledge your darkness? You know, from dark comes the light, not the other way around. Right. So if you're not willing to acknowledge those darker emotions in yourself, how can you say you love yourself? Right. Well, in the physical world, we might even say that because everything is kind of a dualistic in nature, we might argue that without darkness, there is no light or without light, there is no darkness. Right. And the two of them have to coexist in a in kind of a polar a dichotom dichotomistic structure. Now, in the in the absolute spiritual world, that may not be true anymore. But here in the physical world, we have that happening everywhere everything's dichotomy you know we have the male the female we have here there we have left right up down you know black, white light dark all these things that we see in our world seem to be like polar opposites mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and they're important because they help us to navigate through this physical world. So the, the other thing that we were talking about, now we've alluded to it, we haven't actually named this topic specifically, but you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, child work, teenage work, or inner teenager, inner, inner uh, adolescent. Basically, what you were referring to was going back and revisiting, and I did this a little bit myself too, going back and revisiting those old parts of ourselves that we may have disowned when we were younger, disowned for reasons that we believed that they were bad or wrong or something like that, and we didn't want people to see them. and. That's kind of related to this idea of trying to stuff the emotions. I think those two go hand in hand. At the same time that we're stuffing emotions, we're saying, oh, this is bad. This is related to that part of me. And so I got to hide that. How's, how's that been in your experience in your life? Well, what you find out is ultimately because you have been doing that, you're fragmented. You're not a whole person. Yep. You're walking around broken. Like I said, I was a broken 19 year old. Why are you broken? You're broken because there are things that have happened to you in your life that you, you know, especially as a child, like one of the things that we say in, in hypnotherapy is that the, you know, the subconscious is constantly running. And so you can't predict how you're going to receive a message. So if you're a child, for instance, and you're in class and you do a drawing in art and your teacher says, oh, that looks great. However, you didn't color in the lines. You, you know, your, your subconscious is going to interpret that information. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And then that is a story, what we call a mistaken belief. That now you're going to carry all the way through until your adult, your adult years, and you're not you're going to battle with value as a result of it. And that's just one scenario. Imagine having different scenarios where it's repeated in your lifetime when you're young, and right. when you don't acknowledge that, what you're not able to do is you're not like you said earlier. You can't get to the root of what is causing you to have those feelings. If you can't find your value. Because what will happen is, is you're going to try and you're, it's going to be like bucking up against a wall. I found this for years. I was like, no matter all the energy work and everything I was doing, I couldn't, where was my confidence in myself? It took hypnosis to, you know, change that because it was pulling it out at the root. But even still, there's other way, you know, other levels of that, that, you know, require your awareness. And it, requi it requires actually looking at and acknowledging those feelings within you consciously and, and really healing it and reframing the story, reframing the perspective, being able to say, I know that I have value because I am, everybody has value. We're a spark of the, of the divine. And therefore, we all have value. Just to exist gives us value. So even if you don't have a spiritual belief, if you exist, you have value. The same way that people want to, you know, volley for different causes, okay, right. animals, whatever. They're saying they exist, therefore they deserve, okay? If you exist, you deserve. What do you deserve? You deserve to be happy. You deserve to, to see your value and for others to see your value. But if you're not willing to acknowledge where that, that mistaken belief came from, you're not getting to the root of the problem. And so it's going to be very hard. <clears throat> what I have found with going back, dealing with those younger versions is you, in order to become a whole person, you actually have to acknowledge that inner child, they, that inner adolescent, they don't go away. They're, if you look at psychology, psychology talks about this. They are there and they are parts of who you are. They will always be who you are. They are some aspect of you as yeah. you are, show up as an adult. Therefore, if you don't acknowledge them and you don't take time to connect with them and reintegrate, they're going to keep pinging you. I get anxiety sometimes. And I have to like literally stop because I feel like cringing in my, in my stomach and I have to stop and I say, okay, is this little Nadia that's having an issue or is this the adult in me? And I can hear one or the other. Most of the time it's little Nadia. And when I hear that, I have to stop and I have to make time and go talk to her. 
Yep. And in those conversations, she'll say, I don't feel safe. I don't feel loved. I miss so-and-so. I, and we have that conversation. And then I, you know, and through that, I show her love because yep. that's what really loving yourself looks like. It's loving all of you. Absolutely. Yeah. So I love what you said at the beginning here about, about value. And I just wanted to kind of put a little bit of a, a bow on this because I believe that we all have value, every single one of us. Furthermore, I believe that there is no person who is any more valuable than any other. Right. We all have the same value. Now, I have people kind of challenging me on that because one of the things that having value doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're going to be more popular or as, as popular as somebody else. Popularity has nothing to do with value. It has only to do with what people seem to like in the moment. That's all it is. And it's not saying anything about you being un, unvaluable because someone else happens to be more popular than you. And that's really, really important. And the other thing is, why would you necessarily want to be that popular anyway? Is that really what you're trying to do is get your ego all boosted? Is that the idea? Well, that's not going to really work for you in the long run. It's not going to solve those problems that you may have. It's not going to give you the liberation and the freedom that you're looking for. It's not going to reconnect you to your innate spiritual nature. But knowing that you have value and that no one, even the most popular person on the planet, is no more valuable than you is a really important thing to, to grok and to take it in and to understand it in your heart. That's something that I like to tell people all the time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one of the biggest truths that became evident for me recently was being in that mode of people pleasing, which has been something that I that began as a child, as a result of hearing my parents fighting and arguing all the time. What I realized is that little girl decided that she needed to fix everything because uh -huh. people were sad and because people were having hard times and it was making me sad. And so for me, I know that that's my root of the people pleasing, but my people pleasing goes to the point where I would listen and take the opinion and the words of everybody else instead of listening to my own truth. And I really like in the past, just a couple of weeks got to this place where it was like, wait a second, who are they that I need to listen to them more than I listen to my own self? <laughs> like, what? Great question. And it was like, it was like one of those aha moments of wait a second. Yeah. I, that's a value thing. It's understanding that, you know what? I grew up being told I was bad. Now they didn't come out right and say it. My parents were loving people. They did the best they could. It was, but it was the situations and how my subconscious interpreted sure. what, I, what was the discipline, what was being said. Yeah. And so for me, that still was in me, that little girl who said she was bad. Therefore she couldn't make her own decisions. My ex did it for so many years, told me you're bad at discernment. You're bad at making good choices for yourself. You're bad. So like, you know, having that information being fed to me all my life, it was like, I thought I had to listen to everybody else because I wasn't capable of, of making good choices for myself. And here I am, a, a life coach who's empowering people to understand the inner truths within them is more important yeah. than listening. Little bit to of a disconnect. <laughs> so yeah. I was like not listening to my own message, <laughs> but I finally got it. Right, right. And that's not unusual, by the way. There's a there's a lot of people. I would say there's a lot of people go into therapy or become therapists more to help other people than to help themselves. Even though a lot of therapeutic practices require therapists to get to go into therapy themselves, the the truth is, therapy can can be a good place to hide out. It's true. You know, that I, no matter how good a therapist you are, how good a coach you are, you cannot force people to do anything. The best you can do is tell them what you see, help them to see for themselves the truth within themselves. And then guide them to make, or, or to empower them rather, to make decisions that help them to move forward. That's really all you can do, you know. And and even a lot of our medical practice, you know, the psychiatrists and the psychologists, they focus more on, oh, I'll just give you this drug and that'll take care of the problem. 
In other yeah. words, it's just another form of spiritual bypass. Escaping. Yeah, it's escapement. That's what it is. So the question is, the, the idea of giving a pill is often is 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 likened in 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 a spiritual environment to pray it away. Yeah. And you know, tell me a little bit. How do you deal with people who are caught in that pray it away syndrome, uh, or take a pill and make it go away? How do you deal with those people? Well, I think that the key is really kind of bringing them back to sh making that shift from being a victim to being in control. Right. And, you know, it's really reminding them who's living your life. And are you, did you come to this planet to live for everybody else? Or did you come to this planet to live for yourself? Because when you, when you're living for everybody else and you're sacrificing, you're, you're a martyr. Do you, and I, I've asked, I've been very blunt with some clients. I've been like, are you, are you committing? This is a form of, of suicide. Or oh. is that what you plan on doing is, are you trying to commit suicide? Because by putting everybody else before yourself, you're killing yourself a slow and painful death. And wow. so it's really, you know, sometimes it's, it's that sometimes it's really kind of reminding them, but then it's also too, it's helping to shift them from being victim. I think with the pray it away, it assumes no responsibility for your life. Right. And the reality is this, God gave you free will. I don't care what book you look at. It talks about free will. If you have free will, then you have the ability you have been empowered. I, I've used the terms, you know, Jesus said that the, the, you know, the temple of God was it within you. You know, we were given the same ability to create that, that God had to, to make this world. We're essentially living out the universe within the universe's mind. So, I mean, if you have those abilities to create, then you have a choice. Therefore, your life is not something that's happening to you. It's happening for you and with you, and you have the opportunity to be the co-creator. Right. And you know what else I want to add, to, add to this? I think that's a, I mean, that's great stuff. There's so much material here. We could talk for hours, but the truth is not only uh, am I choosing, uh, well, let, let's go back to this. The way my life shows up is based upon the choices that I make. All right. It's not based upon I mean, to some extent, it might be affected by choices other people make. And I can allow other people's choices to have complete effect on my life, as you said. But if I allow that, that, too, is a choice. So ultimately, everything boils down to my responsibility. It's my responsibility in my life to to have do and be the way I want to have do and be. That's up to me. It's not up to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Even if I happen to be born into an environment where I am taught a very particular religion and I buy and accept all the beliefs of that religion, ultimately, I am choosing. Even if I am choosing at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, what we have to remember, we as we grow up, we have to keep going back and looking at our choices. Mm -hmm. All right, I chose this. How is it working for me? All right, I chose this. How is it working for me? All right, I chose this. How is it working for me? If we don't do that, then we just basically become, we let life happen to us mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of we happening to life. Yeah, we're right. Exactly. And, and you know what you said is that we constantly need to look at our beliefs and we need to question them because I think that we become robots when we aren't willing to say, wait a second, these are my beliefs and values, but do I understand, A, they were drilled into me, they were hypnotized into me from a young age, they were conditioned into me, every belief, every value you have, if you did not pick it up recently in your adult years, came from somebody else. So do you want to go through your life living everybody else's beliefs and values of your environment, of your peer group who had a big effect on you and right. your parentals? Because is that belief or that value serving the direction you want to head in? And mm -hmm. I think the key is, is what I ask my clients and what we go back to, what do you want to feel more of in your life? There's a survey done and it's like the top 10 things people want. 
what they want to feel. They want to feel secure. They want to feel joy and happiness. They want to feel financially abundant. They want to feel free. Well, how can you get and feel any of those things and have those experiences of those feelings if you're not willing to take responsibility for your life and for your own inner work that has to, to happen for personal growth to get you to what you want to feel more of? And if you're not willing to question those beliefs and question those values constantly on an ongoing basis to say, is this lining up? with the direction I want to head in and what I want to feel more of, then you are a robot and a victim to your life instead of truly living it. You're in survival mode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I often tell people that um, every belief is a limiting belief, like it or not, because the moment you believe one thing, if you believe X over here, then by implication, you don't believe not X. And anything that comes into your awareness that that uh, contradicts X, you generally tend to uh, exclude it pretty quickly rather than trying to modify your belief. So this is a good practice to get into on a regular basis. Just sit down, write down, what do I believe? What do I believe about the world? What do I believe about how I show up? What do I believe about this, that, and the other thing? Just write it down. Don't judge it. Just say, this is what I believe. And then ask yourself the question, does that belief still serve me? Does that belief still make sense? If I didn't believe that, what might I believe instead? These are questions you can ask yourself to kind of modify, revise, maybe throw out beliefs in, in exchange for new ones. And so, yeah, yeah. It's an important process. And it's really important to do when you're in your emotions. Yeah. When you're in your emotions, that's the best time to say, what is it that I believe at this moment that is making me feel like this? Right. Because if you can identify that, then you can see what the limitation is and you just shift the perspective because there's a whole world of possibilities. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Nadia, I want to start wrapping this up now because we're getting close to our end time here. Actually, we've gone a little bit over, but that's great. It's been an awesome discussion. One thing that I want people to get clear on is that we absolutely encourage people to develop a spiritual practice for themselves. That's a really important thing. And in order to be able to develop that practice, part of the work is to look inside, find out what you're feeling, find out what the triggers are all about, and heal whatever trauma might be underneath that. Is there anything else you could say right now, Nadia, that helps people understand how to avoid this spiritual bypass trap? Yes. When you're having feelings, emotions that don't feel good, that's the moment you have to have that conscious awareness to say, oh, wait, what is this about? And where does this start? Where's the root of this? That's really important. And the second thing is to understand that the word heal can imply that it's a, a finite but this is something that's going to be ongoing. You're going to basically be that onion that is never ending. Life is the journey. And that's where the focus is, is on the journey, not the destination. And so just Absolutely. keep peeling back those layers, taking, making awareness, say affirmations, do what you need to do to be, to shift into conscious living that says, I'm going to begin to practice the, the consciousness of what am I feeling? How is my body responding? Because that's another clue. And then I'm going to take that time to journal about it, to talk about it, to get it out of me, because you have to get it out of here. When you take it out of your mind into a different mode of communication, you can see it from a different angle, a different perspective. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and I totally agree with everything you're saying. I just want to add another detail onto that. I would encourage people to set some time at least once a day quiet time. You can call this meditation time. You can call it whatever you like. But what Nadia was saying about uh, looking at your feelings, don't wait for a trigger to happen. Don't wait for something uncomfortable to happen. Pick a time every day and just quiet down and go inside, do a little bit of internal reflection and say, how am I feeling? You know, and maybe what you can do, one of the things that I like to do sometimes is just Imagine I'll just have my eyes closed and I'll just imagine that there's a light coming in through my head and it just comes slowly down. And I let that light just kind of look around inside me. And, you know, if I, if I see a spot that seems to be a little bit 
it doesn't want to be illuminated for whatever reason. And I, I pause for a moment. I look at that spot and I say, well, what's going on there? What am I feeling there in that spot? It might be in my cheek. It might be over here in my clavicle. It might be down my belly. It could be anywhere in my body. I just pause. I shine the light on it and I say, what is it that I can do to give you permission to tell me what you're feeling? And as I do this, I become more and more aware of what's going on in myself. And I can take some time to journal it, write it down afterwards and start keeping a record. And then when you do have those moments when you are triggered, you'll find that that process is much, much easier. So if you, if you practice it when you're not under any kind of stress, it, you're developing a mindset, you're developing a kind of a habit. And so that when the trigger happens, it's much, much easier. And when you do this, believe me, you're going to start opening up channels to heal yourself, to make yourself better. And that, in turn, gives you access to deeper spirituality. I love it. I'm going to start. To, I mean, I journal every morning. That's like my morning practice now. So it's yeah. like you dig in and you start writing down everything that's going on in your mind. But I like what you said. If you yeah. just every day check in with yourself. And exactly. I would say don't do it in the morning. I would say like middle of the day after you've yeah. had enough time to to go through the day. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Or even in the evening. Absolutely. That's great. Great idea. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Well, Nadia, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. I've just really enjoyed our conversation, and I can tell that there's a lot more here, and I'm definitely going to have you on the show again sometime because there's a lot of energy there that I just really enjoy. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So yeah. It was so wonderful. Can't wait for the next time. <laughs> yeah. And also, I wanted to say to all of you who are watching, thank you for participating in today's program. You can watch recordings of this and every other show on my website at lifemasterytv.com. That's life-mastery-tv.com. And as you go through your week, I'm just going to remind you of the Life Mastery Mantra. Gratefully forgive the imperfect being you have been in the past. Gratefully accept the magnificent being you are right now. Gratefully welcome the evolved being you are becoming in each new moment. Until we meet again, this is David McLeod, your Life Mastery Coach, wishing you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. See you next time.